gas training, how an ideologic combi boiler works. My name is Alan Hart and in today's video I'm back at Viva Training Academy and Roy, I've got Roy back, so Roy's the expert trainer and Roy's been a trainer for many years. Roy's going to show us how an ideologic hydroblock works, also the Vogue, the Vogue is very similar to this. Also one of the questions that's asked quite a lot is, do you open the air vent? Do you leave the air vent open or do you close it? Roy's going to answer that question as well in this video today. So without further ado, let's, let's go over to Roy. This video is for gas safe registered and trainee gas engineers under supervision. Please comply with the current regulations at the time. Thanks Al. Hi guys, it's Roy Field here at the Viva Training Academy over in Halifax again. And today we're going to look at an ideal hydroblock. It's a hydroblock that's come out of a logic. Some of the components on there I'm led to believe are out of the vogue. Um, so without further ado, we'll crack on. So this is part of the series that we're doing on various hydroblocks. So some of the components you may have already seen on some of our other hydroblock videos. Because what a lot of manufacturers are doing now, they're taking certain components and one manufacturer will use that one, another manufacturer will use the same part. So straight away we can see on, on here, we'll go through. So on the right hand side we've got the return, so it's returning back from the radiators into the pump. So this is pre-ERP, so it's not a modulating pump, it's just a standard um, single speed pump which will be set on its maximum speed. On the back of the uh, pump, we've got what's called the volute. It's a posh word for the plastic bit at the back. And on there, we've got a low pressure sensor or a pressure sensor. So that thing is measuring the pressure in the boiler, so it's acting there. If we get too low a pressure, it will activate and give an error code out, and that will stop the boiler firing. So it's to stop dry fire. So that's what that little fell is for. And it's just literally clipped into that hydro block at the back of the pump. So that bit's there, um, just round the corner from that we've got the PRV, it's a typical standard type of PRV, 3 bar PRV, and it's got the top hat type washer on, and it's also got the hex nut on there, so it can be demounted, so it can be unscrewed and cleaned out if you've got one dripping, typically the reason that these drippers, uh, as we've shown on a previous video, is expansion vessels losing the charge, so it can't take up that expansion of water, so you're getting too high a pressure on there and any dirt in the system um, can sit on the seat on there and cause us problems. We've also got at the back the auto air vent. Again, that is uh, replaceable. It's on a quarter turn is this one. So it's just quarter turn and we can pop it out. And the auto air vent, we've got a little cap there and you've literally got a float. So when we've got water in there, the float lifts it up and it seals it. If we get any air at the back of there, it will drop down and then the air can migrate up. One of the questions I get asked quite a lot is should we leave that cap open or closed after we've installed the boiler? The answer is we should always leave it open. The idea is the back of the pump, it's called a volute. It's an area where there's no um, positive or negative pressure. You get a neutral point. As the water's being drawn through there, there's a neutral point. So any micro air bubbles in the water can go into that part of it and then they'll migrate up there and clear it out. So that's why we always leave it open. I know sometimes you'll see them where they've had a leak on, but that's usually dirt that's got on the seat because it's a dirty system. So that's uh, the auto air vent on there. So next we're coming on to the water turbine. So this is a turbine, it spins round and we've got a cutaway in there and we'll zoom in and let you have a look on there. So this has got a little sensor on the top which picks up that that turbine is spinning. Now, in a previous video I described it when I strip one down, you've got a, a little circular uh, device in there and it's magnetised at either side. Now he called it the cake and a few people like that. Nobody sent us any in yet, so we're still waiting me and Alpha, somebody to bake us a cake and send us one in. So that's the uh, receiver unit for that Hall effect sensor. That's what it's called as that's spinning round. Um, 
one of the things I've invested in, I've spent a bit of money, I don't get a lot, but uh, I've, uh, I've checked out a couple of these tools for removing the top of the, uh, the Hall Effect Center. Um, and I found it quite useful, it fits on there. I do use an 18 mil socket, but that fits on quite well. And it uses a 13 mil spanner on the top of it, or a 13 mil socket. I've also got the one which removes the castellated um, cartridges and heads. So I'll show you that when we strip that, uh, that part of the hydro block down. So I'll show you those shortly. Plate heat exchanger in the middle. So it's the cold water that's coming in through there activating, spinning the turbine so it's going through there and then the water is going through the top side of the plate heat exchanger so it's moving across. So then the hot water is coming out. As we can see on this hydro block there's no hot water uh, thermistor. So how it determines the hot water temperature is monitoring the flow thermistor and then on the circuit board there'll be an algorithm which is a post calculation that will work out if the flow temperature is this and everything else is correct, the flow rate and the cleanliness of the system and the plate heat exchanger, the hot water should be achieving the set temperature as the manufacturers say. So we've got the diverter motor on there. So the motor, I'm just going to unclip, unplug it and unclip it. So it's one of these standard um, three connection motors, uh, neutral in the middle, live at either side, so it motors down motors out so it motors both for heating and hot water so it sits in the last position it was used and we'll show you that because we've got a little switch on there which we can activate so this is on the uh, on on the floor side now so the water comes down from the main heat exchanger going down into the chamber and uh, then if it's in the heating position it allows it to come out around the radiators and in the hot water position it goes into the plate heat exchanger, moves across and then goes back through the pump so it's heating the plate heat exchanger like that. On this particular hydro block it's not a cartridge. On some manufacturers they're using cartridges. On, the pre on a previous video that we did on the back set we showed the cartridge and they've had two versions of that. The brass and plastic and the old brass version. So this is where this little castellated tool comes in handy. So it just fits on there, again to castellations, and I've just got my little 13 uh, millimeter socket, and uh, I'll just pop that on, just set it up, and then now I can quite easily, and obviously this one, I've had it in bits, so I can strip out that section. Now there are spare parts available, so you can rebuild these hydro blocks without replacing the complete hydro block. The back section, you'd need a, a, a spanner or an adjustable spanner to remove the back section. Now on this one, because I've got it on the board, it's a bit closer to the, uh, the board than the boiler uh, normally is. So you can generally get in there with a spanner and remove it without taking the complete hydro block out. So that's just a little bit about it. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna um, zoom in so you can see some of this in more detail and I'll just cover some other bits and pieces. Right, so we're going to put it all back together and then I'll, uh, I'll explain which way is the water where uh, the water flows through the hydro block once we're, uh, we've got it back assembled. So it just literally pops in, it pushes down because the pin at the moment is what we would call out. So it's at the top rather than being set in. So that's pushed in and then we just pop the clip in. So as we can see, the water's coming down off the main heat exchanger. So this port here is closed. So that's the heating port. So we're open to hot water there. So on this particular version, um, when that pin is down at the bottom, so it's what we would call the out position, this boiler is in the hot water position. Now, on other manufacturers, the backs that we looked at, when the diverter motor's in that position, it's actually opening the valve to go around the heating circuit. So just be careful when you look at the valve and you take them out, be familiar with the particular manufacturer you're working on because it could be in heating or it could be in hot water depending on the configuration of that valve. So I'm just gonna operate the little switch now. So now the motor's gonna move and you can see that the uh, seal is moving across there to close off the water port and we've opened up the heating port so water now will come off the main heat exchanger go through into that chamber down through the floor out round the radiators back up through the return 
and then come back round um, until the customer decides that they want hot water. They turn the tap on, the Hall effect sensor determines that there's a demand. So then the motor gets a signal and it moves across, closing off the heating port and opening up the hot water port. So one of the things that can happen, as you can see in there, there's two rubber seals. Now I've cleaned this hydro block out. This came out of an actual working boiler that had been in a few years. I've cleaned it out and polished it up. This had quite a bit of debris in there and the washers were starting to get a little bit um, soft and, and uh, squishy. It, uh, and what can happen is water can pass. So one of the complaints that you can get, particularly in summer, if the uh, heating washer is starting to deteriorate or it's got a little bit of dirt on the seat, is the customer's running a bath and the next thing they're complaining about is that there's a radiator starting to get warm. You won't generally get a complaint in winter because usually the ones in the uh, central heating on, the complaint in winter will typically be the hot water's not warm enough. Now, as we all know, in winter, the water coming out the road is cooler. So the temperature rise on most boilers is set at 35 degrees. What that means is the water coming in is raised by the boiler 35 degrees. So if we said it was coming in at 15 degrees, it would come out at 40 degrees, sorry, 50 degrees. Right, so we've just mentioned the water coming in is raised by uh, 35 degrees. So if you've got that situation where the customer is complaining that the, uh, in winter, that the hot water is not quite as warm as it should be, the way to prove it is by turning off the flow return isolation valve, then running the hot water. If the temperature of the hot water is getting hotter, you know that you're getting all the heat from your main heat exchange going into your plate and there's nothing leaching round. But just be careful. I don't want you opening a can of worms. Some boilers that have been in a while, the isolation valves, you start turning them on and off, they can leak. So just, just be aware of that. If it looks a little bit dodgy, don't do it. It's more than likely going to be your diverter valve. They're quite easy to strip out as we've seen and as we've looked at. So what we're going to move back onto, I'm just going to have a look at the Hall Effect sensor and explain that a little bit more in depth and explain the things that can happen in that. So basically the cold water comes in, goes into a chamber, it goes through a flow restrictor and a filter. It then goes up there and there's some little arrow, uh, some little guides which push the water around. And what that does, it starts to spin the turbine. So as that turbine's spinning, inside the, the head, there's a little receiver unit, there's a little um, PCB, a printed circuit board, looking for that magnetic signal. As I explained earlier, we've got that cake with a magnet either side, and as that's spinning, it's magnet, no magnet, magnet, no magnet, and it picks that up. And some boilers use that to determine the, the speed of the water, the water flow, so they can modulate the boiler. So if a customer slows a tap down, that can actually trigger the boiler to slow down to reduce the amount of gas because obviously we don't need as much gas to heat us a lower flow rate. Now one of the things that can happen with these, so I'm going to take it out and sort of show you um, inside it. Now this one's a cutaway, we, we put it down so you can look inside it. So I'll just whip this out. So inside here, we've got a little flow restrictor. The idea of that, if your mains pressure's coming in quite high, there's a little rubber inside there, and what that does, it allows it, there's a, a rubber which compresses, and that reduces the flow going through. So that's the, the, the flow restrictor. Now inside, underneath that, you have a little filter. Now that can get blocked up, so one of the complaints from the customer could be, the water flow isn't as fast as it, should be, so they're not filling the bath as quick, or it could be that they've got intermittent hot water because we're not getting sufficient flow to allow the turbine to spin round. So again, these things you can take out. I've stripped this one down. Sometimes you can replace, you can replace them. It's a replaceable part. Um, being an engineer, I like to pull things in bits. It's not always as easy as that. And I know from talking to some engineers, they have struggled to get these out. If you do get one out and you're putting a new one in, 
Same with the diverter cartridge or the diverter insides. Always, always put a little bit of grease on your threads, which allows them to go in and allows you to take them out in the future and always grease up your O-rings. So that's, that's it for this uh, edition of the Hydroblock video. So thanks very much for watching. If you've enjoyed it, put a like, put a tick, put some comments down there. We love comments to me and Alan. Good, bad or indifferent. We're open to it. If I've made a mistake, please let me know. I'm only human. I'm 59 years old, so I sometimes forget what I'm doing. Um, if there's any other videos you'd like us to do, please get in contact. I've just got, a, I've just remembered something. So Wilbur, this one's for you, mate. Down on the Isle of Wight, you wanted me to comment. So hi Wilbur, I've done this one for you, mate. So from me, Roy Fugler over at Viva, until next time, thanks very much for watching. Bye bye. Thanks very much for that, Roy. And once again, thank you to Viva Training Academy for all the help and support that you're giving to, to new trainees and gas engineers that's been doing it a long time as well, to be honest, there'll be lots of people. I, I get lots of people phoning me, to be honest. I, I've had somebody this morning actually has been doing the job over 20 years and thanking me for videos that me and Roy's been doing because he's been learning quite a lot from them. So we've got a full playlist now for Viva Training Academy. So if you if you have a look on my channel and you look at playlists, you search for the Viva Training Academy playlist, then you'll see that we've got a full section of videos, me in some of them, Roy in some of them. We've got Russ in some of them. We've also got Richard in some of them as well. And, and they, these videos, we're gonna try and build them as much as we can to help you. So if you do have any questions, or if, you, if there's all that you need any help with, then please put me in comments below and if you can as always if you can put a thumbs up on the video it really does help and um, and thanks for watching